Uh, we want to thank the Lord for today, and we've been studying for a good long while Ephesians, and today we're coming to chapter 6, which is probably the best known chapter of the book of Ephesians uh, because of the full armor of God. But we want to start at the beginning, and uh, remember that um, back in the fall, I'm going to take you all the way back to back in the fall, and then it's about November, the Lord showed us the king's table, and he invited all of us to come to dine at the king's table, and then he started pouring water down, all this water down, mm -hmm. and it was the living water of God, and the table was standing in the water, and the only way to get to the tro to the table was you had to wade through the water. In other words, you're going to have to press. And on that table was the menorah and the cross of Jesus Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. And so ever since God gave us that vision, we've been studying in the book of Ephesians of what God was trying to say to us through this particular vision of, of seeking his face. Now, in Ephesians 5, where we left off, Paul was giving instruction to husbands and wives on a marital relationship and how they were to treat each other and submission to each other and love for one another. And so when we go into chapter 6, uh, Paul gives more instruction on accountability in relationships. And he's, he's talking about the family, he's talking about the children, and how the children are to be taught by the parents uh, how to obey and how to honor. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along over the years, uh, we've lost a lot of that. And that's one of the reasons our world is in the situation it's in. If you cannot honor the people that you can see, mm -hmm. how can you possibly honor God who you do not see? Mm -hmm. We have to honor one another. So, um, as he said, he was really strongly with the fathers He's telling a father, and here we, can, we go with part of the problem in this generation, is the desertion of fathers from families and the divorce rate that we've had. And fatherhood has taken an incredible blow. And then we have the situation where the fathers of this generation, and even of our generation, were not really taught by their fathers how to be a good father. Yeah. So the same situations keep going in a cycle because the wisdom hasn't been given out and the instruction of the Lord has not been known to really how to be a good father. All you gotta do is look at Father God and you'll see the best father and mother in the world. Yeah. It's him. That's right. He is him. But he tells fathers that they are especially not to stir up anger and provoke their children. Um, and I think we can really put mothers in that in this generation, that mothers also, would not be domineering and controlling uh, because it brings so much damage. And children, and even older children, even adult children, are damaged by such abuse. And, and they, they lose a part of their identity and they have to seek after finding out the reality of who they are in God. Only God can make that possible. He, he makes that possible. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the trainer in all of that. And he says, raise up the children with discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Now in Proverbs, many of the Proverbs that you read, Sol Solomon teaches that we gain, we are to gain the wisdom of our father and use it. And then we are to listen to the instruction of our mothers. And so when this family unit is going on and there's respect for one another, and, and there's the following on because the parents have more wisdom than the children, hopefully. In some cases, this day and time, they don't. <laughs> but the parents would have more wisdom so that the children can come up and they can even be better parents themselves. That is over with, but right now we have to deal with all these situations. Many parents did not take their children to church. So even other people in leadership could not give them any training. You take a child who never went to Sunday school, who never read a Bible with his family, and I'll show you a troubled child. When we, when we have been in church, and, and when we have had Sunday school teachers, and when we have 
had the contributions of others that are anointed to teach and to love us, it just adds to our lives. It adds to the fullness of who we are. We need each other. We need each other, but the, the body of Christ and the body itself is so disjointed in this day and time. We have to fight for survival, and we have to see things for what they are and love one another. Love covers a multitude of faults and failures. But when those faults and failures get covered, let's not keep repeating the same thing over again. The Lord um, has told us that there must be much healing, much deliverance, much forgiveness, much forgiveness. And if we haven't, if you haven't been raised up but jerked up, there's a lot of healing you have to go through. And sometimes, in your own capacity, you can't, because you haven't been educated in it, you're ignorant of it, you don't even know what you really need, you just know you're frustrated. You know you're in pain. So when somebody comes along that can actually give you some answers, that's why I really strongly suggest not only the reading of the Word, but reading good counseling books. Christian counseling books, reading what makes people tick, what makes them act the way that they act. It helps us to then know how to deal with them. It also helps us to set parameters around ourselves where people cannot intrude on us because we recognize who they are and we recognize there would be trouble. So to those of us who are older, uh, Pat and I are very grateful for the years we lived in that were less complicated and less pressurized. And we've got, I've got memories of being able to walk down the street safely at 10 o'clock after being downtown in my little town, <laughs> walking home safely, singing away and just going home and never thinking about it. My parents didn't ever think about it either because the streets were safe. We didn't have the darkness that we have now. I'm very grateful for the years when I wasn't under that kind of pressure. And um, after speaking to the families this way, Paul goes on in verse 5 to describe how servants and masters treat each other, submitting to one another. And of course, in that day and time, a master could just speak death over his servant and it was over with. They had absolute control over them. I mean, they owned them. And so for this teaching to come out, remember your brothers in Christ now. Treat each other correctly. Servants, you work, and you work hard. Masters, you treat them right. You take care of them. And, and for this, the kingdom of God really works. <laughs> the trouble is we human beings don't do it. We don't surrender to it. But the way God wants to set things up, people would be healed, people would be whole, and people would be productive. So, in verses 10 through 18, we have what I would call the most famous section of Ephesians, and that is the whole armor of God. Uh, years ago, I could just picture this when I was that reading over this. Years ago, uh, we were taught to just visualize a Roman soldier. We were taught that. I don't know who was the first one in your life to have a flannel graph and they just put that Roman soldier up there on the board and you can see him in his full armor and then they explain to you Ephesians 6. Now, the good thing about that flannel graph and that picture is you remember it. You remember it. You remember what those terminologies really mean. And I lived in a day when little boys always had at least two things. They had uh, little army men that they would play army with, sometimes leaving them on the floor and hurting your feet. Or they would have them outside in the dirt and they'd be playing army. Or they had at least one silver gun, maybe two, that were cat pistols. Those things were loud. <laughs> I mean, they'd really scare you. Your brother would just walk into the room and you didn't know he was there, wham! <laughs> you don't know what's going on. That's real powder in there. 
And so when those cat pistols would go off, I know my brother used to always be going to my mother and he wanted more money to buy more caps <laughs> so that he could shoot more of those things. But, and, and little girls played with their baby dolls and played mama. Life was simple. <laughs> the Roman soldiers in Ephesians, that, that picture of the Roman soldier was certainly birthed in the spirit, but it was also birthed by the fact that Paul was surrounded by Roman soldiers for years. He had them all around him, and he led most of them to Christ. In verse 10, it says, In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, be empowered through your union with him. How do you get power? Be in union with Christ. Draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. Doesn't matter how many people attach to him, you'll be able to get all the strength you need. He never runs out. He's always got the supply. Put on God's whole armor. All right. What's the active verb there? Put it on. It's provided for you, but you have to put it on. That's a choice. The armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the strategy and the deceit of the devil. This is supernatural. It's heaven sent and it's blood bought, this armor. It's heaven sent and it's blood bought and it's real. Jesus has conquered and therefore we are conquerors. His victory is our victory. We are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. And we're talking about the second heaven. And that's where all these things reside. And that's where their high altars are located. And I really thought even this past week as the Ukraine was being invaded and we saw Russia and then began to hear about China's involvement, began to hear about Iran's involvement. I mean, go back about to the 1940s. The spirit that was on Hitler, the spirit that was on Stalin, the spirit that was on Mussolini, those spirits have arisen again in the same area of the world. I thought, wow, God, things cycle. They cycle. But God will give us conquering power to bring these things down. And therefore, verse 13, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And so you have to resist it. You have to fight. And having done all the crisis demands, stand firmly in your place. So you put it on and then you declare the truth. You declare the power of God that is with you and in you and conquering any device of wickedness so that you can live a peaceful life and a life full of hope and stability. Verse 14, stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins, having put on the breastplate of integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing with God, and stand strong in the word and live a godly life. I think we were all surprised this past week when the president of the Ukraine turned down our president's offer to send him a plane and take him out and said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Hmm. He said exactly what he needed to say. They have stood strong. They have stood strong. And I can't tell you they're all depending on God, but I can tell you the whole world of Christians are praying for them. And there is a covering of God over this situation. All right. Having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. We have on our feet we, God gives us hinds feet. He gives us, when we need them, he gives us snake boots. And we can walk through the territory and not get bit. God will cover your gospel feet whatever way they need to.
to be covered in order to let you stand and stand strong whatever you are facing, whatever you'll ever walk through. God's got you and he will cover you because of the price Jesus has paid. And then he says, lift up over all the covering shield of saving faith. And we always picture the huge, you know, the Romans uh, shield was huge. It was like the size of a door. And when they would lock those things together in absolute unity, they became a battering ram. There was no light in between. They just became this battering ram that people shooting at them could not get through. They couldn't penetrate it and they could advance against their enemy. But we are to lift up that shield of faith and we are to trust our God. And the word says, upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. I don't care what anybody ever throws at you. I don't care if it's one of those rocket launchers that we're seeing in the, in the news now. Whatever the weight of the battle, Jesus is greater. Sure. You lift up your shield of faith, and I guarantee you, God Almighty, shield of faith will come over you. He is the protector. Mm -hmm. He is the one that cannot be beat. He is the one that cannot be conquered. He protects his people. Mm -hmm. Now you got to count on that, and you got to believe in that with all of your heart. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the Spirit wields, which is the Word of God. So you got the covering over your head. I've got a friend years ago, she was an intercessor, and she said, I asked God to give me ear flaps. <laughs> I don't want my ears exposed. I want everything to be filtered through those ear flaps of faith and so that my, my thinking is protected. Well, that's a beautiful thing because the enemy attacks your mind, attacks your mind, attacks your mind mm -hmm. all the time. So you need that helmet of salvation. And that cost Jesus the thorn on his brow and the blood that pierced him came running down his face from that horrible thorny thing, saves your mind and gives you the mind of Christ. He did not shed his blood in vain. He took care of everything we will ever need. He submitted to the Father to do that. He knew how hard it was going to be. But God brought him through. God brought him through and raised him up on the third day. And now he is king and Lord forever. And he is our God. And he is our protector. Thank him for his great faithfulness. The word of God is your sword. And that's why we always need to be studying it. We need to put it around us. We need to memorize it. We need to consider it and meditate on it. We cannot watch too much of the news right now. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, when this war first broke out, it almost overwhelmed me. I got such a burden. I don't know when I foiled what I've like just gone into such intercession over these people and over the situation the world now finds itself in. Because you're looking at that and saying, is that Pandora's box? What have we stepped into? How far will this go? And so we pray. Because I still believe in my heart and God has not told me different. That God is going to give us a space of time to get souls saved. Mm -hmm. I want that space of time. I want these people to be rescued. I want them to know God. And not be lost and go to hell. I mean, we're living in a moment of time, beloved. When whenever you get an opportunity to speak, the Holy Spirit will prompt you, be bold. Be bold to tell them the plan of salvation. Be bold to tell them their need of Jesus Christ, a personal Savior, and not just that they've been to church now and then. We need the real Jesus, mm -hmm. like never before, to be honest. Like never before to walk through these last days, and we are in the last days. But I think God's going to give us a season to get these people redeemed. He says, pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. you got to get the attitude of the Holy Ghost. Open your mouth and declare the word of God. Pray much in the spirit. I don't even know how many languages I pray in. 
Whenever I go to a new level of battle, God gives me another language. There's one language that I, when, he, when he puts it on me, I know I'm in the throne room of God. I know I'm before the Father. He actually almost broke my jaw to give me that language. <laughs> I thought, what? In myself, I thought, what are you doing? But I trust the Holy Spirit. But he gave me that language, and when he anoints me to speak that language, I know I am before the throne of the Lord. And whenever he's given me another language, it gives me another dimension of conquering. The Holy Ghost is the one who battles. The Holy Ghost is the one who knows how to win the victory every single time. Lean into him. Speak loudly at times. Now, sometimes I pray softly in the spirit and just I'm just coming into the presence of God or whatever. There's other times I just stand up and shout and walk all over, stomp all over the house. You got to get into it like you mean it. And you got to mean it from your heart. And that's when the enemy knows he can't take any ground. He can't take any ground. I mean, there's been twice this past week I've come up against a demon. And both of them, I just stood straight up and I said, there ain't no way. There is no way. And I dealt with it until it was done. You are going to have to fight. I am going to have to fight. God has chosen us to believe us in these last days so that we can stand our position and be good warriors and stand with him to help people to be saved and rescued and healed and delivered. There is going to be so much deliverance that is necessary in these mm -hmm. last days because they've been so brainwashed and they don't know the reality of God that we can bring to them. So he says... Keep alert, watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. And that's what we need to be doing right now for every Christian in every nation, and especially the Ukraine, uh, the Balkan states, uh, all that area over there. Pray for every believer. Pray for every Jewish person that needs to get out and get back to Israel. This is where we are right now. God's calling the tribes home. And he's going to rescue believers that will stand strong. And he will turn things so that we can get done what he wants to get done. No matter what it looks like, Satan is not in charge and he never will be. He's already been conquered. We just have to tell him so. Yeah. And sometimes you have to say it very definitely. <laughs> and then Paul closes his letter. Pray also for me. And I think that's a request of every one of us this morning. Let us pray for one another. That freedom of utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in a chain, a coupling chain in prison. Imagine that. He's an ambassador, but he's in chains. He can't get out of those four walls. An ambassador goes somewhere. An ambassador takes the word somewhere. Little did Paul know that what he wrote in prison and when he was in chains would rescue the church, establish the church, and keep us right till the last day of time. You don't know what God's really called you to do. You don't know the way God's going to use you in this day and hour. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. Spend the time with God that you need to. Fast and pray when you need to. But you keep that line of living water flowing so that God may do with your life what he wants to do. He's going to amaze you. You may look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, I just did that. You'll get to know who you really are in Christ. And you're much more than you think you are. So let's put the Holy Ghost to work in us and through us for the glory of God. Let us, like Paul, pray to boldly declare the good news of the gospel. And he says, I want to declare it boldly, courageously, as I ought to do. So then he says, peace be to the brethren and love joined with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Grace, God's undeserved favor, be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying 
an incorruptible love. Amen. So let it be. Amen and amen. Father God, we're asking you this day for a double portion because we live in a difficult hour. We're asking you, Lord, to literally jack us up in the Holy Ghost. Add the dimension of the Holy Spirit that we need to live in this hour and be victorious for you. Add to us the souls we are to reach. Add to us the people that are to be raised up from sickness. Add to us, Lord, the fullness of your gospel. And let us walk strong. And let us truly be a demonstration of what only God can do. And Lord, in a unit, we push back the darkness. We push it back. And we declare light is coming in to rescue souls and to bring people into the kingdom of our God with liberty and freedom and the fullness of the power of your spirit. Let the church of the book of Acts be birthed again. You're on the move in the nations, Lord. So this morning we pray for every believer and we pray for every soul that's about to become a believer. And we're asking for a mighty move of the Spirit right in the midst of the devastation. And we declare, as the enemy has brought war, we declare war on the enemy. Mm -hmm. And we declare our Christ rules and reigns and is absolutely victorious. I bless every one of these intercessors, Lord, with courage, bravery, a mind that thinks the way you want them to think. Freedom. Freedom. To be who you want them to be in this moment of time. Loose your people mm -hmm. to become what Christ died to make them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.